everyone, it's Brooks. Happy holidays. I am here to discuss our December book club book, Holidays on Ice by David Sedaris. And I have a special treat because my friend Beth is here. Hi, Beth. Hi, Brooks. Hi. <laughs> and Beth was the one who helped me pick this book this month. I sure did. <clears throat> which I'm I'm so appreciative of. And I know it's funny because I was just texting with some another friend about this, but it's scary to pick a book for a book club because you're like, oh, God, what if everyone hates it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which is how I feel every single month, every time I pick a book. Um, and I think this month we had a really interesting um, reaction and experience with a book that I did not expect at all to be controversial. <laughs> Neither did I, Brooks. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was going to be just like a really cute, fun holiday read. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, Holidays on Ice is the 2008 release version of David Sedaris, who's very famous uh, American humorist and author and um, radio contributor. And he's really famous for a particular short story called Santa Land Diaries. And that short story is in here. So this book called Holidays on Ice is a collection of short stories that are all kind of loosely about the holidays, all written by David Sedaris. Some of them are about his life, kind of, and are written from his perspective. And some of them are not. They're about characters. We'll talk about that mm -hmm. more later. Um, but it's a cute little book. It reminds me a lot of our book from last December when we read um, Truman Capote collection of short stories. Um, they're like really similar. I held them up next to each other and I was like, oh, they're they're like the same. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. In, in size. <laughs> yeah. In size. And like, yeah. So I was like, oh, good. This will be great. I like to pick um, – Shorter books for December because everyone's so busy, although I think this year was a bit of an anomaly. I had plenty of time to read. I don't know about <laughs> yeah, <me> you, Beth. <laughs> yeah. Um, but typically everyone's running around, you know, rushing around and very busy. So, I, yeah, I thought this will be a good one and an easy one and a quick read and a cute one to get us all in the holiday spirit. Unfortunately, not what ended up happening. Huh, Beth? <laughs> no. Um, no. And let me just say, you know, we've talked about this, but I picked this book because um, I'm a big fan of This American Life, the podcast with Ira Glass. Um, it's a wonderful podcast and they have David Sedaris on all the time and they read um, essays of his. And so I've listened to, uh, I've listened to Santa Land Diaries at least twice, if not three times via This American Life or just on the radio um, in some respect. And it always has just brought me so much joy and made me laugh out loud. And, you know, if you'd asked me before reading this book, if I thought uh, St. Land Diaries was, you know, uh, just a G-rated holiday romp, I would have said yes. And now, <laughs> after reading the printed version, um, <laughs> I think we both feel a little yeah. bit differently about it. Yeah, it's so crazy. Because I mean, I was the same way, Beth. I had read Santa Land Diaries. I'd seen it performed. I've read a bunch of like many David Sedaris books um, and always found them very funny and um, satirical and irreverent. And, you know, I've never had, <laughs> never had this reaction to it either, to the material. Um, so we can talk about that more, but uh, we had book club last night, so I'm really excited to have Beth here so we can sort of debrief on how it all went. Um, and I, you know, Beth, I, <laughs> listen, this is not, this is no one's fault. Sometimes we don't like books. That's a normal thing of reading books. Not everyone's going to like them all the time. So I want to, I want to absolutely absolve you of any guilt or shame. Um, yeah. Because you suggested a really famous book by a really, really famous author. And I was also really into it. I think everyone was. Our reactions to it are interesting and worth talking about. But, um, you know, <laughs> it's certainly not your fault. I think and this no podcast is dedicated to everyone out there who ever recommended something to somebody that ended up being like way more uncomfortable or offensive or just yes. unsavory than they thought it would be. <laughs> right. And we've all been there. We've all been sure. there um, with everything. I mean, that's true for movies, any kind of art. Um, everyone has a different threshold for what they consider to be appropriate. Right. And I think we're all in a really sensitive space right now. It's been such a weird and hard year. And I think a lot of this material is just ringing really differently to us yes. at this time. Yes. 
Um, but I definitely, and Beth, you and I were talking about this, like, I think someone needs to write, and I hope it'll be you, some kind of, like, expose on this and our reaction to it. Because we were all Googling around, like, certainly there's some, someone is reacting to this negatively on the internet, right? And we couldn't, like, barely find anything. Yeah. So, I don't know. Someone Maybe needs to talk about it. I'll go to nose to nose with David Sedaris. I'm sure oh, good luck. I'm sure he would have loved some of my sketch shows <laughs> in oh. the basement of different theaters. So <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes. Um well so so our first question is always did you like the book? I think it's probably clear to you all who are listening that we did not. <laughs> yes, in general, uh, it was we it. got a lot of thumbs down, <laughs> a lot of thumbs down in book mm-hmm. virtual book club, uh, Zoom book club last night. There was one, I think there was only one thumbs up. We had someone on the fence, um, you know, and we went around and talked about it. And I think everyone kind of said the same thing, which was just that, you know, he's a great writer. There were a lot of redeeming moments. Um, so we liked some of the stories. There are, I think, 11 stories in total in this book. So there's quite a few. And um but overall, yeah, we were really uncomfortable with it. It came across kind of mean, spirited, um, very elitist, like pretty out of touch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, what did what 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 do you think, Beth? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say like, <laughs> um, I was thinking a lot about it today because you know there's a difference between like when you're reading a, when you're reading something. And one line sticks out to you as being offensive or weird or racist or whatever. You know, we're kind of in a society now where we don't really let that kind of stuff slide anymore. And I am not, I am not a cancel culture person. I am not the kind of person that says, because you did this one thing 30 years ago, I will never like respect you or listen to you ever again. However, yeah. This is, you know, this was sort of like watching the first few seasons of The Office without having fallen in love with the characters and followed it through, you know, 11 seasons or whatever to the end. Because a lot of us don't really know David Sedaris that much. So we were like, you know, those cringy moments in The Office, which honestly, a lot of this does remind me of that style of humor, because it's just stuff that you wouldn't put on TV anymore. It's, you wouldn't write it anymore today. So right. it's hard because in, in a similar way to the office, I had a lot of moments in this book where I was laughing out loud. I mean, truly cackling out loud. And I love when a book can make me laugh out loud. It's pretty rare. Yes, like, it's rare. It is. Rare. Uh, yeah. It, it's rare because I think we ingest comedy so specifically via television and media in that way. And so to have a sentence on the page make me gut bust like laugh is really exciting. But in the same respect, I think 10, 15, 20 years ago, where you might have just like passed over a paragraph that maybe like rubbed you the wrong way, we're just way more aware of ourselves now. So it's like it kind of tainted the stories when you would get to a line or a joke that was just like, ugh. <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot of that, like, cringe. Yes. Just, like, I feel like I was cringing. Yeah. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like, are, do we have to? No, yeah. Do we have to go there? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of stuff that we're talking about nowadays that I feel like, yeah, like, exactly, 15 years ago, we weren't. Like, we weren't talking about ableism. We weren't talking about, what am I trying to say? We weren't talking about size inclusivity. That's what I'm trying to say. Sure, sure. Like, we weren't talking about trans rights. We weren't talking about gay rights as much. Um, and it, all of that stuff. Yeah, and, and I think totally even 15, different. 20 years ago, we we reserved racism for, like, the most overt and obvious forms of, you know, racism. <laughs> like, right now, right. nowadays, we know a lot more about microaggression and microracism and, and that kind of thing. And... It doesn't mean that we can't talk about people who are different than us in a comedic way, but it it's not funny when the butt of a joke has anything to do with race. Like it just isn't, we right. just don't find that funny anymore. 
Yeah. Nor should we. Yeah, I would say or size Mm -hmm. or, I mean, I'm feeling really sensitive this year to socioeconomic status. Yes. And there was that one story um, that I know you really liked. And I, and you know, I also liked it. I I saw what he was going for. It was the producer guy, um, like giving the, he was a really out of touch Hollywood producer giving the speech to like the poor people at the church. Yes. Yes. Or Tennessee or wherever. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's hard satire on like the elite of America and how out of touch they are. Right. But even reading it, it was just felt icky. Like, I'm like, we don't need to talk to poor people this way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did like that story. I did think that was a little more on the nose satire than a couple of the other stories. Like I felt it was very much making fun of the Hollywood elitist type. And so in yeah. that respect, I really did laugh at that story. Um, whereas that one, that one was called uh, "Based Upon a True Story," yes, um, which clearly it is not. Um, but <laughs> whereas a couple of the other stories, for example, the second essay uh, where he is basically playing a white suburban mother who's writing their annual Christmas letter. And she talks about a Vietnamese girl showing up at their door, insisting that her husband is her, the girl's father, and then just living right. with them. Now, that is also very satirical. However, yeah. you have these moments, and I had these moments throughout the book, and I think that's where that icky feeling comes, is, am I laughing at this or with it? And I really think mm-hmm. that I should be laughing at it. And there are some times when I feel like, am I, am I laughing with this character who's supposed to be a terrible person? Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't like that. uh, And that makes me feel bad. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Well, there was like, I mean, this book was, came out in 2008. It makes me think of, did you ever watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Absolutely. (laughs) Man, like there was this whole spate of media where none of the characters were likable right. where we got shows and movies and books full of unlikable characters who were all bad people. And you kind of, all of a sudden you, they were all antiheroes. You didn't have like one positive protagonist and that was sort of the style. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder if like this really fits in with that, which is that this book of short stories about terrible people, like saying and doing terrible things. A- absolutely. Without realizing they're doing it. Absolutely. And, you know, you were talking a lot yesterday about how in comedy, you never want to punch down. And that means we never want to make yeah. fun of people who are, you know, of a marginalized group or who have less than we do or are, you know, smaller <laughs> than we are, literally. Um, but I do think that this book does have moments that it manages to punch up really well yeah but I think it's Mm -hmm. also punching down it's like doing it's it's doing it at the same time instead of like only having the redeeming comedy be from punching up at the elitist and the rich people and the white people and yeah um yeah but I also wonder how recent that like idea of punching up is right like has that emerged in the last 15 years? Very possible. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, As a rule. we've l- definitely learned that certain things aren't funny. And I mean, you can just going back to the office. I mean, there are just episodes that you watch now that are just so uncomfortable and you could never release them on TV in 2020. Like mm-hmm. it's just, you don't want to make fun of people for being gay. We don't want to hear characters using the F word, you know? Right. Uh, Right. So it's, it's just interesting. I mean, that, that being said though, there are really nice moments in this book. Um, Like Christmas means giving the, the story where. um, That one I thought worked. Yeah, with where the two neighbors yeah. are just trying to out generous each other. It's, and I mean, it takes it. We want to talk about comedy. You're always trying to heighten, right? Like you want you want to take things to the next level, and this is like the ultimate version of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a great premise. Yeah, and I think it is pretty well executed. There was only one section in that where I was like, ooh, and and I agree, I agree, and I think. 
<laughs> I most readers would probably uh, maybe shut it off after that <laughs> moment, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that one was good. Hey, it's JD from the Hyman Podcast. Using a narrative storytelling approach, the Hyman Podcast was created to start conversations, conversations that need to be human. Week by week, I'll break down walls and barriers and make people wildly uncomfortable, all the while giving a voice to the voiceless and the marginalized. Consider this your personal invitation to be part of that conversation. Um, but the, even then, after that, after that, we go on to Dinah, the Christmas whore, which, as you pointed out yesterday, yeah. uh, we don't really use the term whore anymore. We don't, you know, use the phrase prostitute like in, a, in any negative way or at all um yeah but it's actually a really heartwarming story <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes it is yeah I mean that one and I and I do think um and we've talked about this a lot especially with like horror genres and stuff or if you're reading classic works of you know um of fiction I think we can give a pass to writers who use, you know, specific terms and language that is now outdated. I mean, language is ever evolving. Um, you know, we're all learning every day um, what words that are inappropriate or that may be offensive to certain groups. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, we're all guilty of, you know, I mean, I, when I was in middle school, I used to say that things were gay until I learned that that was derogatory and I shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm, and then I stopped. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're all, all learning all the time. And so I think, that one I feel like I can give a pass to because the language that we use around sex work today in 2020 is so different than we did in 2008. And I don't think that's David Starris' fault. I don't think he could have known. He couldn't have predicted it. Like, it was appropriate for the time. Right. So I'm totally fine with it. And, you know, while I don't love reading those words. I get it. And we can't change them. And that's how it was written. And that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean. Um, so I think. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I just think that story in particular is a good example of like, it still worked. The premise still worked. The structure of the story still worked. Um, like it all still worked for me, despite the outdated terms. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think the same is true for several of the other stories. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it wasn't just about the terminology. It was about um, just broad, like it more broadly what the stories were about. <laughs> Yeah, like well, I mean, the treatment of people in them. Santaland so, Diaries kind of is, you know, his most famous essay. And like yeah. I said, listening to it on the radio, they just remove um, some of this language that is really, really shocking. Like, I think you used that word when we were texting about the book. And I, I totally <laughs> agree. I, I, I almost laughed in a way because I was like, I couldn't believe what I was reading just to hear, just to see a couple paragraphs where he's making, making fun of, or just observing, you know, people with special needs in a way that is meant to be comedic. And it's not, yeah. it, it's just, it's just so, and that's not to say that a writer can't talk about the struggles of a, a mall Santa having to deal with all kinds of people. Like, I do think that that is, you know, what makes the story great. It's just, there are a couple turns of phrase where it feels like, are you making fun of people with special needs? Because that's really upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he was. Yeah. Certainly, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> certainly he was. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what are some of the themes of this book? We had some good ones last night. Yeah, definitely like elitist, elitism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wealth. Yeah. Entitlement. Kind of like entitlement as a societal problem. Entitlement is um, definitely one, yeah. Yeah, which I think is really interesting and cool. I mean, and that is like the satire of this. I think I said this towards the end of Book Club last night, but I have been marinating on it more, which is that I also think this book is hitting differently. Because this book is really all about how the Christmas season is kind of, it's, you know, it's, like full of shit and it's consumerist and it's unnecessary and doesn't really mean anything. And we've lost the whole point of it. And why do we do it? And you know, yeah. he's working in malls and he's working in cafeterias during the holiday season and it just sucks and it's bad and everyone's mean. And like, it's, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't have that feeling this year because this is such a weird holiday season and I'm just feeling really like I want to, 
Like, I don't want, I don't want to be mean about Christmas right now. Right. Like, I want to have a really nice Christmas. It, <laughs> and I would love to be yeah. like pinned against a wall in a mall trying to get the last of right. something right now, which I've never done in my Wouldn't life, but it love, sounds fun. Right. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm trying to go sit on Santa's lap for the first time since I was six years old yeah, this year. Yeah, exactly. Like, what I wouldn't I give to have my lap <laughs> on a stranger, my butt on a stranger yes. in a mall telling yeah. him what I want for Christmas. Yeah. So it's a weird, it's a weird like holiday to be mean about the holidays. Yes. <laughs> I think. But like last year, I think that would have hit totally differently because like last year, I do remember being so stressed and similarly like, oh, my God, like, why do we buy these gifts? Like, this is too busy. Or I'm really stressed out, like, you know, trying to juggle all the holiday parties and work and family obligations and, and gifts. And, you know, we're all yeah. just so tired by the time Christmas finally rolls around. Um, so I, I even think just as recently as last year, like I probably would have been more on board. <laughs> Yeah. Some of the stuff he's saying. Absolutely. Um, so it's funny how subjective, like, the art of reading is. Like, it's so about what you're going through and what's happening in the world and, like, how you're feeling in the moment. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like we've all been broken up with and we're reading, like, the most romantic novel we've ever read. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God. like, you just don't want to, you know, like, this is not what I need right now. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I need right. ice cream. You don't, yeah, you don't break, get broken up with, and then go like emotionally cut by watching the note. Right? Like, yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. The other uh, theme that I wrote down is rich people suck, and that is actually a theme that does resonate with me this year. Because mm-hmm. um, I think you know the pandemic has really worsened like the socioeconomic divide, and it's just like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and I want to eat the rich people. Yeah. Um, so that did work for me. Yes, definitely. Yeah. As a theme mm-hmm. for 2020. Um, so, uh, specifically, which of the stories did you like? I know you said you liked, um, based upon a true story, which was the one about the Hollywood film executive. Yeah. I re- I mean, I really liked that one. I want to find it, um, if I can, because I want to read some of the, the so the Hollywood yes. producer is trying to get this poor woman from a small town who has an incredible story that she transplanted a kidney of hers to her son with no medical experience, um, <laughs> which honestly gave me the biggest laugh of the entire book. But um, the, oh. the Hollywood producer is the producer of such sitcoms as Eight on a Raft, Darn those Fleischmans, The Dating Cave. <laughs> I mean, some of these, some of these names are just like of the, the TV shows, just really, really coping with the Kavanaugh's. <laughs> and here's some satire for you. White like me. <laughs> White like me. Um, so I just thought, I, I thought this was really inventive and just very funny. Um, he's basically telling everyone in the town that he's going to buy them a car if they can convince this woman to sell him her story. And he just talks to them like they are the absolute scum of the earth and yes. and thinks that he's so great for doing it. It really did make me laugh. Yeah. It's extremely like belittling um, while he thinks he's being like, you know, thoughtful and yeah. understanding and he thinks he's like on their level and it's just like, all of it is ridiculous. Um, I also really liked one we haven't talked about was um, it's called us and them. And it is the story. It's a true story. I'm assuming um, where David Sedaris is probably eight or nine I think and um this family across the street doesn't have a television and he's absolutely fascinated by the fact that they don't have a tv and he he can't possibly imagine what like like imbeciles (laughs) they must be to not have a television and the family uh goes out of town for Halloween and they come back the day after and they decide to go trick or treating the day after Halloween. So they show up at the Sedaris's house and the, their David's mom is like, 
go get some candy for this family. And the kids are obviously mortified because they don't want to give away their, their Halloween candy. And it's just, this story really made me laugh because it just showed how selfish these three little kids are, how many, however many there are. And David Sedaris runs to his room and he's just stuffing chocolate, which he ad- freely admits gives him a headache. He has an allergy to it. He's just stuffing his chocolate into his mouth. I mean, I was really laughing at this. And, you know, you mentioned yesterday, Brooks, like there is no lesson really that happens, but you know, in a way that he like, is just ter- a terrible person like is yeah. this terrible yeah, yeah and he's ashamed <laughs> yeah i love i really love the mom throughout this book she is uh portrayed as like a, an extremely moral character yes someone i think with like high ethics who seems to react in situations like the way you would expect someone to react who is like trying to you know trying to like have good manners and and be accommodating and stuff and she, there's that line in this story um uh oh sorry i knocked my microphone there's a line in the story where the mom comes in and like catches him with all the candy in, in his mouth and she's just like look at yourself yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> she just like leaves the room <laughs> it's just like savage like mom truth well, like right there and like, similarly the in the other story where they bring home the the christmas uh, uh sex worker we'll call her um yeah uh, that they introduce her to the mom and she's just like she's like oh thank god you're all safe and just come come right into the kitchen like immediately taking care yeah. of this this sex worker <laughs> Yeah, it's really yeah, sweet. Just treating her like a totally normal visitor yeah. to her home. Exactly. Yeah, in a way that's like very like respectful. Yes. Um. Yeah, and I liked that. I liked that one too. We didn't talk about this before, but that's one of the few in here where I feel like David Sedaris or David Sedaris as the main character, um, kind of like learned a lesson yes. and like did grow a little bit because he does like he's really trying to be like really judgmental of her, and the mom really shuts that down. Yeah. Um. And that, so that was a cool story. And I wish that more of them had that in them, I think. Yeah, agreed. Um, one of my favorites was, I can't, which one was it? It's, uh. Jesus Shaves. You liked that one. Yeah, Jesus Shaves, Jesus Shaves. And the premise of Jesus Shaves is he's taking, I think it's a David Zedaris perspective one. Our main character is taking a French class and they are talking about like holidays. And then one of the students in the class who's Muslim doesn't know what Easter is. And so all the students in the class are trying to explain to this one student what Easter is using like broken French. <laughs> yeah. And it's really funny and it points out, I mean, this is something that resonates for me, which is that like religion is so arbitrary and it's really all based on where you grew up and what you were taught as a child. And it's all kind of made up anyway. And when you start to like objectively look at the stories we tell and the the traditions that we follow that seem really normal to us, they're super weird. Yeah. and (laughs) And they don't always translate across culture. And so it's like, you're telling me an Easter bunny comes in the night and brings you chocolate to celebrate the rising of the dead from a guy who says God's his dad. Like it's just, it's wild. And then they they say in France that a a bell, the bells stop ringing and fly to Rome and come back with all the candy. Right. And then, yeah, a bell delivers it. It's like, what? (laughs) Who made this up? This makes no sense. Uh, But it's really funny. And I do like talking about that. I like to hear around the holidays also about like the different traditions of like St. Nicholas and how different they are in different countries. Like, I think it was it Germany where they have like the like ghoul St. Nicholas guy yeah. who's like really scary looking. Krampus? What's he called? Krampus! Oh yeah, Krampus is great. Like what? I love that. That's amazing. I so yeah, I really liked the beginning of the one of these stories where um he's David Sedaris is talking about like how he likes to get to know new places and small towns, and that he just basically asks like really specific or odd questions like <laughs> what what is yeah. the waiting period for a tommy gun <laughs> yes can you buy a gun here like how long does it take it's, it's just that to me is like is very funny because you know it's true like everywhere you go everything is going to be a little different and 
everything that may seem normal to some people might seem absolutely insane to us. Right. Yeah. I feel like there's always good like Reddit threads like that. Yes. Um, like breakfast foods are really weird and fun to like explore when you go to other countries because like everyone eats a little bit of different food for breakfast and also like again like why is some food breakfast and other food not breakfast like <laughs> it's so stupid Agreed. but it's so specific in like country to country so that's I like to talk about breakfast food when I travel <laughs> and like go try breakfast foods <laughs> I'm a bacon and eggs girl oh are you classic Cla- classic bacon classic, and eggs yeah Mm, I've had a real craving for cinnamon rolls mm. of late. I need to I need to get my paws on some. Unfortunately, it's COVID, so I'll probably have to free make my own. Well, you're a very good baker, baker, so that's very nice. Oh, Beth, I wanted to tell you and Tim that I did my very best Baby Yoda impression earlier today and ate a macaroon. <gasps> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, for, yeah, they were delicious. <laughs> you're more than welcome. That was great. Well, we're kind of running up on time. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted? I feel like we, like, well, with all books, we could really, truly talk for hours. Yeah. Um, but this one was a short book, so we're going to do a little shorter bit of an episode. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about that we didn't, that we didn't get to? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think, like, the only thing that I would like to say, I guess, for anyone who's listening out there, is that, like, it's, like, reading and 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 like the changing tides of like our society and stuff. It's just a really, it's really interesting. And I think that there is merit in like talking about this kind of thing, but also like if you were to crack open this book and be like, this is absolutely offensive and this is not for me. I feel like the great thing about reading is like, you can just try another book. (laughs) Yeah, you like totally can. There's more out there. I think, I, I guess I think that I would say, you know, it's really important to know that, like, there are the parts of this book that are very offensive and, uh, like, very, very not okay in 2020. And we, as a book club, acknowledge those things and try to move past it to see the merit. But it's also okay to just <laughs> acknowledge that let's hope things got better as his career went on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah unfortunately i don't know if they have because he was recently canceled on twitter for doing a really weird cbs sunday morning monologue yeah. about like that he thought everyone should be able to fire two retail employees every year or every holiday or something and it's like hey man read the room like we're celebrating retail employees this year we're not firing them. yeah it was it's very very time. odd very odd and strange it was really strange. So people did not like that and Whoa. it didn't go over very well. So David, I don't know, maybe get an editor. Um, <laughs> Are you listening to this, David? <laughs> David, if you're listening. Um, yeah, but uh, it's, you know, it's great to try books. It's great to retry authors that you haven't read for many years. You might have a totally new reaction to them. Yes. Um and yeah, I, I'm really glad we read this book. It's really fun to read. It's actually, I think, pretty rare that we have a book that most people don't like. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of fun when that happens because we all get to just like kind of talk shit, which is great. <laughs> yes. um, but, uh, you know, here's two reading books that we absolutely love. Five stars in 2021. Yes. Love it. Cool. Oh, I guess I should say that our January book is a book that was actually recommended on our last podcast episode where we all talked about our favorite books of 2020. It was recommended by my friend Rosie. It is the first in the Court of Thorns and Roses series. It's called A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Moss, spelled M-A-A-S. Rosie sold it to me on that podcast. If you haven't heard her uh, (laughs) explanation of it, it's very funny. I think it will convince you also to read it. Um, so that's what we're going to read, uh, in January and it should be a great, fantastical, um, apparently a little sexy, uh, uh, escape. Yes. That we all need a sexy escape in January. (laughs) We need it. (laughs) Need it. Yep. So looking forward to that. And Beth, thank you so much. Thank you for the recommendation and thank you for your time today. You are more than welcome, Brooks.
Books with Brooks is in the Press Play Podcast Network, and our theme music is by Jonathan Allen. Jonathan Allen.